your attention and welcome you to uh, the Kelly, Helen Kelly Symposium for Excellence in Education. Um, I'm Richard Bischoff, I'm the Department Chair of Child, Youth, and Family Studies, and I'm grateful that you all braved the weather <laughs> to, come to, uh, uh, to come to this event. I'm confident that you will be richly rewarded. Um, Marjorie Castelnik, the Dean of the College of Education and Human Sciences, um, will um, say just a few words about our donor, Helen Kelly, and then I'll introduce our speaker. Well, good afternoon. This is going to be a wonderful way to end a very cold and breezy day. I am sure that by the end of this session, you will feel warm of heart and stimulated of brain. Now, I am very pleased to tell you something about the person who is responsible for our getting together, and that is Helen Kelly. Now, you know, I introduce a lot of people, and very often we read, read or we describe all of the different things that they've done. And Helen Kelly certainly has a very esteemed resume. She's a graduate of UNL. She has her certification in secondary education. She worked uh, as a literacy and language teacher, or English teacher, in the West Side schools. But she is someone who beyond, I mean, and she's done a lot of things. She's been on her school board. She's been on the National School Board Association. Uh, and she has done a lot of work and service in the community. But one of the things that strikes me, Helen, when I look at all of the different things that you've done, is this is a person who appreciates learning and a person who wants to share that learning with people around her. You know, you have touched the lives of students at every level of education from the very smallest ones through elementary and secondary, some directly, and some through the good works that you have sponsored in your community. You know, but you haven't left it there. You've said, you know, if you're an administrator, you need to know something more about teaching and learning and have a deep grasp of that. And you have helped academic faculty also revisit those ideals. So all the way from preschool to higher education. That is a wonderful record of passion and a wonderful mission to help people think about teaching and learning in all of its facets and all of its populations. So we are particularly pleased and proud to have you and your family here for this Helen Kelly Symposium. Please join me in thanking our benefactor. You are a great inspiration, and you have made it possible for us to be inspired, not only by your good works, but by the guests who have come to the university over the past three years. Uh, and who have enlightened us in a whole variety of ways, and today will be no exception. So thank you. Rich? Well, it's my pleasure to uh, introduce our speaker, Dr. Freddie Hebert. Um, Dr. Hebert is the president and CEO of Text Project, a nonprofit that provides open access resources to support higher, higher reading levels. And she's a research associate at the University of California, Santa Cruz. Dr. Hebert received her PhD in educational psychology from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. She has worked in the field of early reading acquisition for 45 years, first as a teacher's aide and teacher of primary level students in California, and subsequently as a teacher, educator, and researcher at the University of Kentucky, the University of Colorado Boulder, University of Michigan, and the University of California, Berkeley. Her research, at, her research addresses how fluency, vocabulary, and knowledge can be fostered through appropriate use of texts. Dr. Hebert, Dr. Hebert's research has been published in numerous scholarly journals. 
She has authored or edited 10 books through documents such as Becoming a Nation of Readers and Every Child a Reader. Um, she has contributed to making research accessible to educators. Dr. Hebert's model of accessible texts for beginning and struggling re readers has been used to develop numerous reading programs that are widely used in schools throughout the U.S. Dr. Hebert was the 2008 recipient of the William S. Cray Citation of Merit, which was awarded by the International Reading Association. She is also a member of the Reading Hall of Fame, a fellow of the American Educational Research Association, and the 2013 recipient of the American Educational Research Association's Research to Practice Interpretive Award. Dr. Hebert chaired an, an advisory group on early childhood for the Common Core and serves on the item quality review panel of Smarter Balanced. She has spoken and provided workshops throughout Nebraska. Um, I had an opportunity to be able to go to dinner with her last night and thoroughly enjoyed our conversation. I'm confident that you will enjoy her talk today. Please welcome Dr. Hebert. Thank you so much, and to the Kellys, and um, to the University of Nebraska for giving me this opportunity, and really the first opportunity since I finished graduate school at Wisconsin to unabashedly wear red. <laughs> so you all heard the um, litany of universities that I was at, so if you think about the University of Colorado Boulder, and their attitudes toward red, and then Michigan and Ohio State, and then uh, Berkeley and Stanford, you'll get an idea that this was very special for me to, <laughs> to have to, to return to my Wisconsin roots. I thought a lot about what I could say in a community that has been devoted to early childhood in the way that this College of Education has been um, evidenced by this lectureship, also by the Buffett Center that Sam Mizells is the executive director of. You have had a long history of a commitment to young children. And I'm hopeful that some of the things I share with you today aren't happening in Nebraska. And I am sharing this with you with the hope that leadership can help maybe stem the flow and also act as a resource for alternative models, things that you're doing here. So I want to give a couple caveats in starting out. In talking about how kindergarten has been changing over the last 15 or 20 years in particular, I want to emphasize that I'm not talking about Kathy Wilson's darling grandchildren. She just showed me the products of their preschool today and the things that Lila is writing at age four. I'm talking about the 63% of the kids here in Nebraska that on the National Assessment of Educational Progress in 2013 didn't reach the proficient mark in literacy. I'm talking about the kids who depend on schools to become highly literate. That's who I'm dedicating this talk to. I also recognize that I'm in a non-common core state and I think that's becoming increasingly more non-common um, core states, but you have not been one of the original states. And in so saying some of the things that I am gonna talk about, I recognize that you might not yet have seen some of the pressures that some of the other states are seeing. But typically, as some of the very, very large states in the nation go, so do some of the smaller states unless you have a lot of courage, knowledge, and commitment. And that's what I'm speaking to today. I also want to be clear that I'm going to talk about materials. And materials are only make a difference, right, in the hands of teachers. 
so we can give you a sense of what's been happening nationally. So in talking about changing conceptions about kindergarten, I start with a statement from the Common Core. Again, recognizing that this isn't something that you are dealing with quite the same way as some of the other states, but the statement was made, and this has been immensely influential in the last four years across the country. So I understand actually that a fairly large school district that we might be standing in just adopted core reading program. So if they did, it was Common Core aligned. And in doing that, it complies with this notion that K through 12 texts have been trended downward over the last 50 years. And my talk today is really going to look at, could that be true? Does that really happen? Because, for those of you who aren't directly involved in the educational enterprise, when kids started school in 2011, if you were reading in grade four, the year before, you know, the grade four texts are now, uh, the kids are now reading the grade five texts, and the grade five kids are now reading the grade six texts, at least the levels are designed in that way. So text levels, have been upped across the grades, including kindergarten. I also want to have as a reference the study in Ed Week, coming from one of our most prestigious journals, American Educational um, Research Journal, where the statement was ba made based on the um, early childhood longitudinal study findings of 1998 that kids benefit from having more challenging content. And we're not gonna argue with that, but we're gonna ask what's the content that is given when people think you need to challenge kids more. That's what I wanna ask today. Okay, so in Education Week's language, they just declared kindergarten is too easy. And they came away with that conclusion. So what I'm saying is, the message we're hearing is, the text in kindergarten have been dumbed down. And secondly, Kindergarten is too easy. So let's take a look. So what I want to do today is, um, by the way, the people on eBay who sell used books absolutely love me. I've now gotten like premier status because we, I've ordered a lot of books to do this presentation. <laughs> okay, so let's look at the evolving expectations of kindergarten. So I'm gonna go, the Common Core was in 2010. I'm gonna go back to 1960. So here we've got 1966, and I picked that kind of intentionally because that's where I could get the copyright, but it also turned out that that's really where, when I started in education. So I started being a teacher's aide in 1966, and this little book, Getting Ready to Read, from Houghton Mifflin, first appeared in the Houghton Mifflin program before 1949, there were no kindergarten materials. So if you think about 1949, I was sort of there, but you know the baby boomers are gonna start kindergarten or start school soon, and suddenly we have a component of the core reading programs for kindergarten. And I, what I've done for all of the copyrights that I'm gonna take a look at today is I've taken the middle <coughs> lesson from the program. So in the middle of kindergarten, right about January, this is what kindergartners in 1966 were doing. This is what we were told has been dumbed down. <coughs> this was 1966. It had gone on for about 25 years. It had started in about <coughs> 1950. So that's not, my math is not a strong point today. Okay, and now in 1986, I actually did a study of all the programs in kindergarten at that place. At that time, I had just finished my PhD. I was, couldn't figure out why there were absolutely no books that kids held in their hand in kindergarten. They were still doing these exercises. So they were copying letters, they were matching sounds, picking pictures out for sounds. That's what they were doing. They, and I published that in Early Childhood Research Quarterly. Now, in 1986, the same program, do you see how they actually modernized the little book, right? Same book. 
but it looks a little different. So we've had it around now for about 22 years. They also had a little book called Ready Steps that was to precede this workbook that kids were getting. So kids only got workbooks. So in all the programs that we looked at in 1986, only workbooks. And here, they still were getting the letters, tracing the letters and the letter sounds, but they also now got some comprehension activities. So they actually got to sort pictures. Okay, so that was new. And then they got to actually read some words. Okay, in this program and most of the other programs, there were about 10 words that kids got to see. And these pages were ones that were perforated so the kids could actually take home some text to read. But that's what life looked like in 1986. And this was across the board. So colleagues and I, in a movement which was called Emergent Literacy, we asked a lot of questions about this. Couldn't kids be involved with real books? Couldn't there be big books? Couldn't they do lots of writing? Couldn't they move little cards around and make words? Well, sometimes you should be careful what you wish for because that in fact happened in 1989 and 1991 in a movement that, became, uh, that came to be called whole language. Okay? So California and then Texas and then followed by Florida and then New York. So then you've got all the big states, right? They called for having a different perspective in kindergarten. So now, this book that used to be the workbook is followed by another book that's actually a little bit ramped up. Okay? And we still have all the other activities that you've just seen, the comprehension activities and the letter tracing activities and the sound activities, but you also have big books. And they're very good big books. So at this point, in about 1989, big books enter the scene. And for some of you who are in businesses other than the educational enterprise, that means an enlarged book that the kindergarten teacher can read and all the kids can participate as the teacher's tracking the print and, and they're reading along. Well, or looking along, okay? Because keep remembering, these are five-year-old kids, right? But this, again, comes from the middle of the program. Okay, another thing that we see is there's a little bit more opportunity to actually participate. So in addition to the letter naming activity, now you've actually got a page where you can draw pictures or if you can actually write words, you can write things that start with that letter. Okay, so these were the things we've been writing about in this movement called Emergent Literacy. And it actually turns out that this was a program I was involved with and at a very early point in my career, I got to see these things come to fruition. And we just were so excited. We also had some inventive comprehension activities, you know, where you would draw the ending of the story rather than have to just pick it as a multiple choice thing. You could, in, in um, there's an alligator under my bed, actually draw some pictures of what might be alligator bait. Okay, so we were really trying to be open-ended here. And, we gave kids a storybook. So for that very first kindergarten level, you got a storybook that didn't have any words in it. So you could retell the story. Because pedagogically, this is the kind of thing we really wanted young children to be able to do. But in the second level of kindergarten, you actually got little books that had stories that were summaries of the stories your teacher had read to you. And I want you to take a look, if you can see that, the quality of the art. It was very well done. Now, one of the things that I thought, uh, learned about in my career, is you should always think about unintended consequences. So now the expectation is there that you can put words for kindergarten kids to read. And what happens in the interim is that we have the very first state-by-state -state comparison of the National Assessment of Educational Progress. And California doesn't come out very well. And California had been the first state to go in this direction. And there were statements that were made that whole language 
was the reason California didn't come out very well. So there were some responses, and one of them was a set of books that were really um, institutionalized in 2003 with no child left behind. So now think about kindergarten. Everything I've shown you, except the really interesting pictures in the children's books, everything is still in the program, but now we have something new. You can't see this, but I'm gonna read it to you. We have something new called Decodable, and I want you to understand that in the 2003 program, this is the middle lesson in kindergarten. Now, I don't know if it's aspirational. We only think we should expose kids, but this is what we're exposing kids to. The book is called Pal Has Ham. Lil has one big ham. Bill has one big pot. Bill can fill the pot. See the very big pot hiss. Excuse me, I actually made a reading miscue there. I added the word very, and you might be asking if I have dyslexia, we can talk about that later. <laughs> Bill has ham, Lil has ham, Pal has a big ham. Okay, so starting in 2003, this is the first time this level of text appears. The texts haven't been dumbed down. This is an incredible acceleration. And if you think, in my state, of about a quarter of a million kids coming to kindergarten who don't speak English as a first language, trying to read that Lil has ham, if you want to sit and listen to something that's agonizing, go into a kindergarten class and work with those kids attempting to make sense of what this is. Okay, oh, oh and by the way, there's a follow-up. This is about Bob, Bob hit it, and I think you get the gist of these stories. And then there is also, so starting in 2003 with No Child Left Behind, there are three little books for every kindergarten lesson. The third book teaches high frequency words like the and is and a. Uh. Okay, so that's 2003. Okay, <clears throat> so that brings us to 2010 and the Common Core State Standards. And I'm gonna suggest that the revolution in what's happened in kindergarten is so great that no one even asked any questions that the K-1 ban was put together in the Common Core State Standard. And a, a list of books was given for kindergarten and first grade that didn't distinguish between what should be at the beginning and what should be at the end. American teachers have been left not knowing what kindergarten really is. Okay, now the big difference with the Common Core is that now we have informational text. Okay, and so when you go to the same program, keep thinking, everything that we've gone before, these are just some examples of what's on the Common Core for K-1. So it goes from having wordless books to books with some pretty hard words, but not that many of them, to books that used to be in the second grade curriculum. Okay, so here we've got now the Common Core edition. This is 2014, this is their brand new program. Everything you saw before is still there, but now we have a big book with science and we have little books on top of the other ones you saw having to do with science. And keep remembering, this is what kids are gonna see in January, okay? So, um, <clears throat> with respect to that first question, have the text been dumbed down? I don't know what those people were thinking. Now, you heard that I was one of the advisors. Just because you advise someone doesn't mean they always listen to you. <laughs> I actually run a free consulting service for my nephews and nieces. And it turns out they very rarely take my free consulting. I also do a lot of free consulting for the airlines. And I have yet to have any of them take my very, very good ideas. So yes, did I consult? I did. But I can assure you that <clears throat> um, my consulting seemed to fall on the same deaf ears as a lot of my other really good ideas. So 
Have text been dumbed down? Well, that's what they looked like 50 years ago. And that's what they look like now. So the answer to the first piece of evidence, I kept asking when I was preparing this talk, what could we look for in terms of evidence? So this is one piece of evidence. The second question is, do we have any evidence that if you push down the expectations to kindergarten, or what if when the Common Core results come out and lots of the states haven't done very well, we also start saying maybe we should start doing some of this in preschool. Do we have any evidence that the earlier you start, the better you do? And in fact, in the national assessments, the evidence says that by fourth grade, when you look at average scores of comparable nations, you can't tell who started early and who started late. But if you look at the standard deviation, that is the index of, of the amount of variation there is between kids, the standard deviation is larger when you start out earlier. In other words, you can actually do things to increase the gap. Now, I'm not saying that Lila shouldn't have lots of great opportunities to write and write and write and read and read and read and to read all the books that kids want to read. I'm asking about the demands on the kids who aren't ready for some of this. So the real question that I want to ask today is, are the expectations for task mastery? We could ask, is the content that I've just shown you just something that people think is nice? We're going to expose kids. If you think back to our view of emergent literacy, we just wanted to expose kids to big books. We wanted them to have these little books that they retold the stories in. But now, these tasks are actually tested. Not by statewide tests, but by teacher-delivered tests. So a question is, the expectations for task mastery do they match the capacity of the majority of the kids, especially those in the bottom 66? And I use 66 because that's the national number. In Nebraska, it's about 63%. Well, let's take a look at some data. Is this seeable? I tell you, using all this red after a while, I just didn't know how much more to use, you know? <laughs> but I couldn't stop myself. <laughs> I was so happy about it. But if we look at the early childhood longitudinal study, so this was a study of um, kindergartners who entered kindergarten in the fall of 1998, and they actually followed them through high school graduation. Okay. And I mean, one of the questions is, are kids coming better prepared? And right now, it looks like on the 2010, so we've just started another cohort of kids that they actually are doing just a tad bit better. Okay? The kids in the fall of 2010 are getting 42%. They've also increased the items, and I haven't been able to get access to those items yet. This is all pretty new. Okay? So I'll be able to tell you um, in a couple months about whether, in fact, it's formal reading skills that they got better at, okay? But if we look at, so this is the specific data from 1998 for the kindergarten cohort. So the first line, the black line, is how the kids did when they came into kindergarten. Then the next line is how they did in spring. And then the final, the third line in the set is how they did in first grade, okay? So you'd see that by the end of first grade, I mean, the basic things like letter naming, letter sound matching, initial consonants, and final consonants, we've got that. I want to take, have you take a look here at how they're doing on sight words. So the sight words, I mean, that's like the, uh, uh, is. Turns out, oh, and by the way, you were needing to read all of those words, right, in the text that I was showing you. It turns out only about 14% of the kids leaving kindergarten in 1999 could actually read those words to mastery. And when we look at reading the text, 
a text, about 4% of them could actually read a text. So what I'm suggesting here is that there's a big mismatch between what we're asking kids to do and what kids are actually capable of doing. One of the questions I raise is, are we potentially increasing the numbers of students who could be relegated to interventions very early on because they aren't meeting the standard as soon as they come into kindergarten? Okay. Now, this is the expectation. The words in red are the high frequency words. <clears throat> and the words in gold are decodable words. So after we've got the Common Core State Standards, you see now that in terms of decodable words, you need to know well over 250 at the end of kindergarten and about almost 100 high frequency words. Let me tell you, if, you, if some of you aren't um, people who teach a lot of kids to read, if you can do that, you're pretty much set. If you can do that, you're set. We should be having 100% of our kids reading very, very well if, if kids can actually do that. So I wanted to show you here the mid-kindergarten text and what we've been doing in our work. These are the one, some of the ones I read to you, right? Cal and Ham. So this is what we're asking kids to read in the middle of kindergarten. And from a huge database that we use, we're able to predict what words kids at the 50th percentile can read. And this is about how much they can read at the beginning of first grade, okay, of the kind of like the Bob and, and Ham words, right? This is what it looks like in winter, and this is what it looks like in spring. I'm saying that these kindergarten books, that's a pretty high diet in relation to what <coughs> kids are actually able to do. So I haven't painted the most optimistic picture. I've been raising questions here about what we're asking kindergarten kids to do. Um, it actually turns out, in terms of the Common Core, what we know is that you can get young kids to learn some of this. You can push hard. But where the real problems come is in about fifth or sixth grade when kids' level of engagement seems to drop. And in terms of our national patterns, that really seems to be where some of the problems lie. Now, I'm not suggesting here today that we can, now that the horse is out of the barn, that we pull back on what we're giving kids in terms of books when they start school. You remember my original commitment, lots of invented spelling, lots of big books, lots of opportunities to leaf through books. But I wanna ask what might be some next steps so we don't go down this slippery slope too much more quickly. I use that metaphor really wisely because today I was a little worried about the slippery <laughs> slopes. I mean, not that there are that many slopes, there, you know, of course there are lots of hills, but, um, but it, it was pretty icy. Okay, in terms of next steps, I'm gonna call on two things that I think are really appropriate for a research community to think about. Some of you are thinking that this woman is speaking kind of a foreign language, but this is what we deal with in beginning reading right now. This is what kindergarten teachers are dealing with. There's, I'm saying that we need to debunk the lesson to print match model of these little books like Bob and Pal and Ham. We need to actually take a look at those books, and I'm going to tell you how they got built, okay? Somebody had a good idea and got it into policy, actually, first in the state of Texas, and then California thought that would be really cool. So this is what the guidelines say in California right now, and we're getting ready for new books in California, but this is what it says. Decodable means that at least 75% of the words consist solely of previously taught sound spelling patterns. Okay, so if a pattern has been taught, then you can, you can have it appear in a book. And 15 to 20% of the words can be previously taught high frequency words and story words. 
Okay, so this is how it plays out. In kindergarten, and this is the standing part of the legislation in California, kindergarten, you have to have at least 35 of these books. And take a look here below. You keep, if it, if it didn't take in kindergarten, you get them up through grade eight. You just keep giving kids the same diet of decodable. So let's take a look at what decodable is. So on the left-hand side is a book that's decodable by Lesson 16, which is what I was showing you. So that means that all of those letters, T-H-I-S-B-O, all of those letter sound patterns have been taught. So that means even if that letter sound pattern, the new letters in this book are H and L. Okay? They have never, kids have never seen those before in this program. But here you see, if, if the book said, and I actually wrote this one myself, it took me about three minutes, which gives you some idea of how quickly some of these books are written, <laughs> and that they are really not literary quality. So this is Deb the Hen. Well, Deb the Hen, you can't ever have in the program because they haven't been introduced to the letter E yet. Now they've seen it in the, but they haven't had a lesson on it. And if you haven't had a lesson, is this making any sense? It's hard, okay, Carolyn's saying it doesn't. Okay, so what they're saying is that if a letter's been introduced with its sound, and kids have practiced it in one of those worksheets, you can see a word, any word with that letter in it, provided all the other letters around it have also been taught. But, for example, they haven't seen U and E yet, so they can't see words like Judd and Jeb and Deb and Hen. That would be illegal. It wouldn't get counted as a decodable text, and they wouldn't make the grade in Texas and California and Florida. Okay. Where did this come from? Is there any evidence that a little kid only has to see a pattern once to learn it? And the answer is there's absolutely none. This was a, a lobby group that thought this was a really good idea. Um, I just wanted to show you what it looks like in other languages. I thought this was interesting because, see, one of the other problems with these little books is it's really weird to see a lot of these little three-letter words. You know, it gets to be like a um, um, tongue twister. So I looked to see what it would be like if you had this text in Spanish. And you see how the words have a lot of distinction and differentiation? Now, I also want to show you the two countries that did particularly well in the, in, in the international assessment this past year. This is what the books would look like in German. And this is what they would look like in Finnish. And I thought I'd also put Polish, but I guess I, I, I hadn't pulled that out. So the point that I want to make here is that this model was built on a study that claimed that this had all been tested out. But the text in this study are very different. Words have a lot of repetition in this program. Okay, so all the words with the phonetically regular pattern are repeated over and over again. I think I've inspired a lot of people to, uh, to go and teach a kid to read. <laughs> Either that or a class is over, the time for the class is over and we can go. Okay. I always think when people leave, I, they're going to find a kid and make sure this doesn't happen. I just so optimistically don't care. Okay. Um, so I'm also going to suggest, I don't know that I, I know that for a couple reading people in this room, what I just have talked about makes some sense. I'm saying this is driving beginning reading for a lot of young children. And if it isn't happening here in Nebraska, just wait. And I'm saying it's an incredibly horrendous introduction to literacy, especially if your culture is a different one than the mainstream, and especially if you speak a language like Spanish. Um, it's 
Spanish functions very, very differently and doesn't, as you saw, doesn't have a lot of, um, of, of those little short words. And you can actually get a sense here of the distinction and um, differentiation that you'd be able to have. Words of different lengths, right? Rather than words of all the same length. Okay, I want to make one more point, and that is, I don't think we have right now in our learning community a sense of what comes before what. So in 1975 to 1986, there was a really distinctive, you know, there were some ideas, right or wrong, there were some very distinctive ideas of what preceded what in terms of learning to read, okay? And you didn't learn the letter L at the same time you were expected to read about 15 different words. Okay, there was a progression. Now, the progression kinds of, kind of looks like this. Everything is kind of presented in a big blob. Okay? And I'm saying that for those of us in this room who are part of a research community, I'm suggesting this is a critical thing for us to be looking at. For all the millions of dollars that have been spent on interventions and reading, billions of dollars, I'm saying we're doing things that just don't make sense. We're having kids learn the letter L at the same time we're asking them to read a word like one or C. And I'm suggesting that that is, just doesn't make a whole lot of sense. We need people to actually have good descriptions of what is needed to learn particular skills in the beginning reading sequence. <clears throat> Boy, I think I maybe went a little too technical here, but I, I had a lot of fun learning this stuff. Um, and for those of you who d did have the class ended and you're still here, thank you. And for those who, of you who could have left, thank you also. But I wanna just tell you a couple things that's changed. Because especially if you taught reading some time ago, you're kind of wondering when did this all come about? So something becomes fashionable. And one of the things that we stop doing in reading is we stop believing that repetition was important. Okay? When we had Dick and Jane, some of you remember Dick and Jane? Some of you don't know who Dick and Jane were. Dick and Jane were a duo that 80% of the baby boomers in North America learned to read with. And they were very, very um, dysfunctional little family because <laughs> Dick and Jane actually had repetitive uh, kind of a uh, compulsive disorder um, where they had to do everything a certain number of times you know, so that they would they would run 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 you know and then actually part of the baby boomer generation actually would have songs that would go with their like fun 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 like that but in in Dick and Jane they did things so many times that Jean Shaw came out in 1967 and said, enough already. And then what do we do? We throw the whole thing out. And I'm suggesting that now that we have these huge databases that we can look at of kids learning to read, you know, computers have let us now look at just huge, huge digital sets of texts and kids' performances. And what we found, these are the prototypical words that kids know in winter, spring, fall, and then grade two. And we're seeing an almost perfect relationship with how many times those words appear in print. In other words, the words that kids are learning, so let me explain this again. The words that kids are learning are the words that appear a lot in the text, not some of those random words like pal and ham and lil. In fact, we don't see the kids learning a lot of those words at all, especially because a lot of them are very, very weird and very, very infrequent. Okay, um, what you see here is very little repetition of, 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 of the words in text, right? And if you think about learning a language without repetition, that's a pretty difficult thing to do. 
So I'm saying one of the things we need to return to is some understanding of repetition and learning to read. It's not a popular concept. Dick and Jane kind of made it very bad for us. What I'm saying here is not very popular at all. And I'm suggesting we've got to ask how much kids need to see some of these patterns before they can learn to read. Here's an alternative in a set of little books that I've developed where within the same book, there's lots and lots of repetition of the same word. They're learning about phonics, but they're also getting to see these words across stories and also across the levels in the program. Okay, so kids are getting to see these words a lot in an intentional way. This isn't Dick and Jane, but it still has a modicum of repetition. And I'm suggesting we need to understand developmentally what comes before what, and we also need to know what you need to see often in an interesting way, not in a pedantic, repetitive, you know, Dick and Jane. Um, I have typed in all the Dick and Jane books. I've got copies of all of them, and sometimes I don't even know if I've typed the page yet, you know, because it all <laughs> seems like it's the same one. So that was a silly as the pal had a bad hand, I'm saying there needs to be some balance, some middle road that's based on better knowledge, and I think we have it. But we've let some state policies really run the way we've been going. So I want to end <clears throat> with showing you what I believe kindergarten classrooms should look like. Okay? So I haven't been suggesting, as people from the Gazelle Institute do, that you know we can wait till seven for kids to learn to read. It's not going to happen. You know you don't go backward. But I think we need to move away from these didactic, incredibly tedious kinds of little books that kids have been looking at, and we need to come to a center where we're ensuring that kids get some sense of the system. And I know that in Nebraska, you're doing that. And it's a state where you have a lot of communication. My friend Sam Weisel says he came today from a meeting where all, what, 11 universities were there. You're able to kind of communicate. And maybe, you know, this is the place where we stop some of the silliness that we've been seeing in early childhood in literacy because we have absolutely no evidence that is going to make the difference for the kids who need the difference made. So let me stop with some pictures of kids having a lot of books read up loud to them, a lot. Kids doing an enormous amount of writing. I think writing is the primary way in which you come into reading. Kids doing a lot with sorting words. I'm all for words. I'm all for the letters of the alphabet. I'm all for beginning sounds. I like sounds a lot. But we also want to bring words from their environments in. I was in the most delightful four-year-old class today here on campus. You know, what those kids are getting to see the kids who depend on schools should be getting too. And we shouldn't be panicked that they're not gonna get it and then start pushing some of this stuff down. I want them to do lots of word sorting, a lot of it. I want them to see lots of little books. Not being responsible for reading them, but picking out some words that they might be able to read. I want them to see hundreds of little books. And to ensure that, I've actually gotten wegivebooks.org to take some of my old books that the publisher forgot to sell and give them away. Okay, So there's lots of little books there for kids to, to that have a pedagogical base to them. And I want kids to learn about things while they're seeing these little books. I've written about 120 of these little books and they're on my website, all for open access, free download. So 
somewhere. <clears throat> and I want kids to just have be inundated with these books. Do you see how this is very different? There's some repetition here. There's something of interest. There's actually something to learn. You know, explain to me about Pal and that ham. Actually, it looked to me like that, that dog had a bone, not a real ham, you know? So that might really cause some problems. And do you, oh, by the way, you do intensive comprehension activities with those books, too. They're like the Pal had, had ham. Kids like, why do you think Pell did that? And so on and so forth. I'm saying I want them to have something of substance. And that's the commitment that I've made at Text Project, where we're, we're generating material like this and making it available. And my hope is that for the kids in Nebraska, they don't have to deal with Pell and Bob, whatever he hid and how, and a host of other books all the way through eighth grade. Keep thinking that that's what some of those kids are seeing all the way through eighth grade. To me, that's not what my vision of, li uh, of literacy is. And I want to tell you thank you for what it is you've been committed to in the state. I think there's an enormous amount of leadership that's available here in terms of getting kids onto the page and getting them to stay there, because that's what we really want. Um, I also want kids to have a lot of great children's literature. We're an amazing time of children's literature. And um, I provide a lot of examples of this. We still have one of the last um, independent bookstores standing in the country, in Santa Cruz, California, where I live. You know, Santa Cruz, where we have a lot of individualistic people there. So you, you, know, you, you, you buy at the um, bookstore, and we have the best book buyer in the world, and she gives me ideas, and I put that on my website. I want kids to have books about stuff that matters. Poems, old and new, lots of stories, fables, and so on. So that's my vision of literacy. Um, I look forward to continuing to interact with my colleagues here in Nebraska as we um, stay the course and um, map out for kids the futures that they so desperately want. Thank you.